The live assessment I will be doing today is on the blue-eyed black lemurs at the Minnesota Como Zoo. I chose this species partly because of their rarity, but also because of existing interest on primate health and behavior in captivity. To provide some background, the Como Zoo was founded in 1897. The zoo is operated by the St. Paul Parks and Recreation Department, and the staff use operant conditioning to train their animals for less stressful human interaction and medical procedures. Como Zoo's blue-eyed black lemurs are named Eugene and Thurman. Male lemurs are black and females are a reddish brown, which made them easy to identify from each other. Their native habitat is in northern Madagascar, and they are considered critically endangered. In the wild, their average size is between 15 and 18 inches, and their weight is between 4 and 5 pounds. Unfortunately, the staff in the primate building on the day I visited were not able to provide me with a lot of supplemental information on their exhibit, so I am lacking certain specific information about Como Zoo's blue-eyed black lemurs, including their ages, but in the wild, they usually live up to 20 years. I also do not know whether these two lemurs were bred in captivity or whether they have ever been housed elsewhere. I took these close-up shots of Eugene and Thurman from Como Zoo's website as they didn't feel like modeling for me when I visited, but they are very cute. One interesting fact about this species is that they are the only primates other than humans to have blue eyes. The model of animal welfare that I will be using in assessing these lemurs and frequently referencing is the three circles model introduced in 1997 by Fraser et al. I've chosen this model because it addresses both object science and human values in evaluating animal welfare. I will begin by assessing the housing standards of the lemur enclosure. In terms of temperature, lemurs can be housed indoors or outdoors, but must be protected from weather and any adverse environmental conditions. In Madagascar, the average daily temperature ranges from 77 to 84.2 degrees Fahrenheit, so indoor temperature should approximate that range as well. The USDA animal welfare regulations state that the temperature should not fall below 45 degrees Fahrenheit. At the Como Zoo, the lemurs were housed entirely indoors in order to provide optimal ambient temperatures in Minnesota, so although they lose some natural living by being housed indoors, their biological functioning may be improved because of the controlled environment. There were also no visible thermometers in the enclosure, so it was impossible to assess whether their temperature requirements were being met. Humidity is also important to assess for welfare because humidity is thought to be involved in cathemorality of lemurs in which individuals become less active or become nocturnal during dry periods. And an average humidity reading between 50 to 81% fits within the USDA's recommendations for indoor humidity ranges. So along with temperature, humidity was impossible to assess at the Como Zoo without access to the internal enclosure. But by abiding by these guidelines, this would appeal to the natural living and biological functioning of these animals. In terms of air quality, USDA regulations require that indoor areas be sufficiently ventilated at all times to provide for health and well-being and to minimize odors, drafts, ammonia levels, and moisture condensation. At the Como Zoo, it was impossible to assess air quality without actual entrance to the enclosure, as the enclosure is completely sealed from the visitor side, but there was no visible excrement to contribute to ammonia levels, which the zoo should be commended on. But on the other hand, I also saw no visible sources of ventilation like fans or windows, and lack of ventilation could result in poor health and biological functioning. For sound, the Como Zoo piped jungle sounds through a metal speaker at the top of the enclosure. There isn't much existing literature on whether using sound as enrichment is useful, so whether this is beneficial to welfare is unclear. But these jungle sounds may appeal to the natural living component of welfare, because lemurs would likely hear similar noises in their native habitats. The AZA U-Lemur Care Guide does state that consideration should be given to controlling sounds and vibrations that can be heard by animals. However, these sounds may aid in drowning out other potentially distressing and unnatural sounds and vibrations in the zoo, which could be beneficial for welfare. Little research has been conducted on light intensity requirements for lemur species, but different species will exhibit different activity patterns according to their level of cathemorality, and without a change in photo period, some lemur species may not enter the breeding season. Daylight is moderated at the Como Zoo by using two large lights at the front of the enclosure. This is useful because the back of the enclosure is exposed to a skylight that lets a natural light. Minnesota day length is obviously quite different than what would be expected in Madagascar, so these lights are important to improving welfare from a biological functioning standpoint. 
The guidelines for equipment is that equipment should be regularly serviced and most importantly out of reach of animals. Although the light fixtures at the Como Zoo are situated within the enclosure, they are out of reach of the lemurs. I do not have information that I would like on how regularly equipment is serviced or whether emergency backup systems are in place to support climate control systems in the case of an emergency. Enrichment for lemurs should provide complexity and stimulation. They are arboreal species and their enclosures should provide opportunities to utilize vertical space. Water features can be included and several materials and substrates are suitable for lemur exhibits. Como Zoo provides enrichment items that include overlapping branches suspended in the air, a large tunnel and braided ropes hanging from wall to wall, fake plants suspended from the branches, a trickling waterfall, and several plastic balls. I don't have information on how regularly enrichment items are rotated to increase novelty and interest, but the multitude of hanging branches would provide the opportunity for species-specific behaviors like jumping and running, and may also improve affective states by providing enjoyment. In terms of room size, little literature exists on the impact of enclosure size on behavior or welfare of lemur species, so the AZA recommends that the exhibit size be based on the size of the group, the complexity of the enclosure, the behavioral needs of the individuals, and the number of non-conspecific individuals that share the enclosure. Furthermore, federal regulations stipulate that each individual lemur must be provided with a minimum of three square feet of space. Although specific dimensions of the enclosure were not available, I can confidently state that the lemurs were provided much more than three square feet of space, and the room was much larger than the viewing window allowed visible access to. This appeals to good welfare from a natural living standpoint, since the lemurs' natural habitat would be expansive and varied. And finally, in terms of stocking density, single housing of animals should be avoided, and pairs or family groups are considered appropriate. Como Zoo accommodates this well and appeals to natural living by housing a male and female together, which improves social enrichment. These pictures show the entire enclosure as well as the natural and artificial lighting used. These pictures show the enclosure's various enrichment items. There were many behaviors I wasn't able to observe in the two hours I spent with the lemurs. For instance, I didn't witness many signs of communication between the lemurs. But both olfactory communication and vocal communication are important to lemurs. Scent is used as an important form of communication for lemurs, and it is used to mark territorial boundaries, advertise reproductive status, and establish dominance between members of a group. I did not see any olfactory or vocal communication between these two lemurs, although it is my opinion that their environment was suitable for performing both of those behaviors. In terms of social behavior, Lemurs form complex and diverse social groups, and females are fairly dominant. This was at least somewhat apparent by the fact that the male followed the female wherever she went, and the two were rarely separated. I wasn't with the lemurs long enough to witness feeding behavior, but in the wild, lemurs spend a great deal of time foraging. Variable presentation of food enhances normal foraging behaviors, including presenting food at different times of the day or spreading food within the enclosure. To my knowledge, the only way food is presented in the lemur enclosure is in a small plastic dish at the floor of the enclosure. This does not appeal to lemurs' natural living, and I would like to see feeding enrichment incorporated in the future in this exhibit. In terms of stress responses, visitor presence has been associated with increased activity and aggression, but a decrease in other species-specific behaviors like grooming. The two lemurs at the zoo readily approached the glass and did not have a large flight zone towards visitors. This may not be a very natural response to strangers, but in a zoo setting, it may appeal to positive affective states as the lemurs are subjected to lots of visitors on a daily basis. Some examples of stereotypies which can occur in lemurs are pacing, self-mutilation, and displaced aggression. I did not see any signs of stereotypies in the enclosure, but I do know that the male was missing several patches of hair from the sides, tail, and back, although I cannot definitively say whether this is a factor of health or a sign of potential stereotypic behavior. Stockmanship and management was the one area that I wasn't able to find a lot of literature on the standards for lemur care. For example, there aren't clear standards on the type of record keeping necessary in facilities housing lemurs, and I could not verify what kinds of records are kept by the zoo staff. I am forced to assume that some type of health records are kept for the lemurs, as is the standard in other zoos. For excrement management, 
The AZA lemur care guide states that all fecal matter and waste should be removed daily. Although I cannot verify that those standards are met, there wasn't any visible excrement in the lemur's enclosure which the zoo should be commended on. For handling, the volunteer at the primate center was able to tell me that the lemurs are handled minimally, except for necessary medical procedures. In the wild, lemurs should not be handled regularly by humans, so this appeals to their natural living, although it is good that the lemurs are accustomed enough to human presence at the zoo that they are not bothered by regular husbandry tasks. The volunteer was also able to share that the lemurs are given yearly exams and receive veterinary care as needed. This is good for biological functioning as good veterinary care is crucial to good animal management. There are aspects of health I would have looked for if I had found literature on it or if I had been able to interact with the lemurs. These include vital signs which were impossible to assess from afar and body condition score. Obesity is a major nutritional problem in captive lemurs. In general, captive lemurs are heavier than those in the wild. From the outside of the enclosure, body condition score was impossible to assess, but the lemurs appeared neither overweight or malnourished, so I take this as a positive sign of biological functioning. In terms of illness, one indicator of change in health status is stool consistency, but I did not see any excrement in the enclosure, so it was difficult to assess stool consistency, especially without knowing what normal lemur stool looks like. However, I did notice that the male was missing large patches of fur from the sides, rear, and tail. I wasn't able to find literature on coat quality in primates and lemurs, but I do note this as a possible sign of illness, although it may be a factor of age or sex. For nutrition, the AZA recommends that drinking water and water features be maintained so they remain free of contamination by feces, urine, food, and cleaning agents, and drinking water should be separate from the exhibit water feature to allow for proper sanitation. Although I didn't see any excrement, the only water source I found in the exhibit was the trickling waterfall, and I did not see any alternative drinking water source. This could potentially be a problem for biological functioning as lack of clean drinking water can result in health problems. And finally, for food, lemurs have been described as generalist feeders and eat a diet consisting of leaves and plants, wild fruits, and occasional animal matter and insects. The AZA recommends providing food in multiple locations within the enclosure, but I only saw one plastic feeding dish at the bottom of the enclosure. The rest of the enclosure is above ground height and therefore it will be difficult to put food there. This is a problem for natural living as foraging behaviors would not be met with this type of feeding. There are three main recommendations I would like to suggest to the Como Zoo. The first are short-term recommendations, which include providing feeding enrichment so that food is available in multiple places in the enclosure or offered multiple times a day to mimic natural foraging behaviors, and providing an alternative clean water source. The last, the last recommendation is a long-term recommendation to rotate enrichment items on an ongoing basis to improve novelty, stimulate exploration, and decrease boredom. The feeding enrichment may be difficult to implement as there is only one ground level entry point for zookeepers in the enclosure, so spreading out food throughout the enclosure may be difficult. It may be easier to simply feed these lemurs multiple times a day, but this may still be a barrier depending on staffing. Providing an alternative clean water source is as simple as putting in a ceramic vat of water that is cleaned and replaced once or twice daily, but again, this may be dependent on staffing. Rotating enrichment items could be a tremendous undertaking for the zoo, as this would potentially involve removing the lemurs so that branches and other items can be rehung in new positions, or so certain items can be swapped out. In conclusion, the Como Zoo has several strengths in their lemur exhibit. These include commendable housing, especially in terms of providing adequate room size, proper stocking density with the bonded pair, and adequate enrichment items. The zoo also does an excellent job with excrement management as the exhibit looked cleaned and well-maintained, and perhaps most importantly, the lemurs looked healthy. There were a few weaknesses in the enclosure which I would like to see addressed. For instance, food placement and offering strategies could be improved to mimic natural foraging behaviors, and a clean water source should be provided other than the small waterfall in the exhibit. Lastly, the environment, although enriched with manipulative toys and climbing opportunities, is relatively static, and the enclosure would benefit from rotating these items or rearranging them from time to time to increase novelty and stimulate exploration.